You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I'd like to begin our proceedings here today by calling out to the helping spirits to be with us. So I call out first to your ancestral helping spirits and to mine. I call out to those people who lived well and died well and bring all that is good and true and beautiful in the legacy of our ancestral lines to us that we might might lean on it, that we might learn from those who have gone before us, gain support in our own goodness, our own truth, our own beauty, and that we can um, ask these ancestors to remember, to hold the memory of what we must not continue to do and must not do again. So that we can go forward, innovate, heal, change, grow, do all the many things that we need to do to create a new story for a new world. And to do that, we must become new people. And I give enormous gratitude to the ancestors for helping us to ground that transformation in in the history and all that we have learned from those who have already been here. And so as these ancestral helping spirits gather around us here today, I call out beyond the humans to those even more ancient ancestors, those who are not in human form, those who have been here on the earth much longer. And I call out to these spirits of the land and great spirits of the land and the plants and the animals and the bugs and the birds and all the many things that are here. I call out to them to help us, help us to surrender to our own true nature to get out of our heads and our mind and our fantasy and to allow our mind to become the tool that it was meant to be to help us to track the real energies, help us to be in good relationship with the real energies and help us to understand what is the real unique energy that each one of us brings in this lifetime. And then to use our minds to understand how do we bring that uniqueness into the world in a good way. And so for all the spirit help in the many forms that we have around us, I give great thanks and I call these energies in. And as they gather around us here today, let us gather ourselves. Let's draw our awareness from wherever it might be into our heads, from our heads into our heart, and from our hearts into our belly. And from our belly, let us take a moment and touch the earth. Let us give thanks for all that has been on our journey that has brought us to this moment. Let us give thanks for this moment in and of itself, this place that we have power to take action on ourselves in this moment. And we give thanks for what will be with a passionate commitment to that future and without attachment to what we think should be the outcome. We give gratitude to the earth for being this place, this home that our life adventure is lived on. And we give enormous gratitude for the wonder and the miracle that is life itself. And may we learn from the earth how to do a better job being part of this great web of life. And as we send our gratitude down to all the layers of the earth, continue to drive our energy down through all the layers of the earth, reaching, moving, using intention and attention to take our awareness down to the very center of the earth. And let us tune in there in the gratitude in our hearts to the nature of this energy, stillness and darkness, that which restores from a place of silence, a place of peace, a place of the energy that is before. It is all those things we think we need and we think we are. That which is none of that. That which is not yet in form, but is the pure potential that can rise up. And so let us reach into that energy just like plunging our hands into a cool spring of fresh water on a hot and parched day and draw that earth energy up into our being that we might understand how to be manifest here in form in a good way. Let the earth energy rise up and begin to inform us with its wisdom. 
how to be in our bodies, connected to ourself, knowing where we stand and what we stand for, and to build our sense of hearth and home from that knowing. Not just what we've been told, but what truly has meaning and purpose in our own hearts. Let us build our sense on that foundation. Let us open our door to those who are other than we are and set a place at our table for those we do not yet know. For it is in that other that we will be provoked to become the men and women we are truly meant to be. So let us learn to open our hearts to those things that are strange to us and allow ourselves to be strange to others. And from this energy of the earth, let us come in then to right relationship with all the strange parts of ourself, to right relationship with the environment around us, right relationship with each other, right relationship with the invisible world. And in this way of connecting and interconnecting and understanding the exchange and the flow of energy, let us drop into that blessed awareness that we are one with all things. And to feel ourselves in that great web of life and know that we are that one strand. And let us gain from the energy of the earth that understanding how to manifest that one strand in that great web. And let us draw the energy of the earth up now. Up from our bellies to our heart and our heart to our mind and out the top of our head. Out into the sky, whatever weather it holds for you, whatever time of day, wherever you are. Let's send our energy up and out, out through the atmosphere and out into the cosmos, reaching all the way up for the highest power of the universe. And by whatever way you know this energy, by whatever name you call it, let's reach out to it to see yourself in it and it in you. And let these radiant and divine energies from above be called in as you draw this energy down, drawing into yourself, into our proceedings, into your day, drawing in protection, drawing in blessing drawing in the ability to commit and to be devoted drawing in the benevolence of this universe around us and to trust the energies that come in to inspire and illuminate and to innovate we call these energies in and we call in the great beneficence of the universe and allow ourselves to lay into that energy and to be held well in our day And as we draw that energy from above in, allowing the radiant energies to permeate our own being and we send it all the way down to the center of the earth, we become the meeting place for heaven and earth, earth and sky. We become the meeting place for these two great legendary lovers and this whole channel then is filled with their big love. And may that big love awaken the spirit of your heart. And as the spirit of your heart awakens into this day, May it bring that crucible of transformation online and let you draw up the fiery passions of your belly that do know why you are here and draw down the crystal clarity of of your mind that can figure out how you might actually do that thing, that why you are here thing. And we let these energies move together in that crucible of transformation in the heart and give birth to this third and most sacred thing, which is you, why you are are here some memory some inkling some sense some vision some awareness of why it is that you are here in your own unique way and may you find the courage that you need in that very same and magnificent human heart to do something in this day large or small to bring that soul's purpose that reason that you are here into manifestation and for the vast amounts of spirit help that we have to do this i give great gratitude but what needs to be said be said here today and what needs to be heard be heard and may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things speaking of living things i would like to thank those of you that are able to offer financially donate financially to the show so i give thanks to cliff and paula to nakaya sarah julie and all of the listeners who are able to donate financially to the show it is because of these listeners that we are all able to have the show it's 350 plus hours of archives at whyshamanismnow.com um, and the new shows coming in and all of this is made possible by the donations of listeners like you 
So if this show is meaningful to you in any way, if it moves you in the heart, if it makes you think, if it um, makes you try something new, if it um, inspires you or frustrates you, whatever it is, it's moved you in the heart. And may you do that most shamanic of things, which is to allow that which moves your heart to motivate your action in the world. And I ask you to do something, large or small, to help the show to grow. That, as I say often, I'm not expecting anyone to give $5,000, but uh, a thousand of you giving five is not unreasonable. And for that, I give thanks. So for all the many things you do to help the show to grow, I am deeply grateful. And know that you can find how to donate and find shows that you're looking for that I refer to at whyshamanismnow.com. And I'd also like to give thanks to cocreatornetwork.com for their ongoing support of Why Shamanism Now. So today's, um, oh, we are live today. So if you want to call in with questions about today's topic, which is what does shamanic practice look like today? And if you want to ask questions about that, you can call in at 512-772-1938. Or you can Skype in from the co-creatornetwork.com site or email me at christina at lastmaskcenter.org. You can also go to lastmaskcenter.org to find the classes that are available this year. Um, those classes that are referred to on Why Shamanism Now, they're all there, and most of them you can register uh, for in the calendar, from, from the calendar in the, on the website. Okay, so contemporary shamanic practice looks different depending on the tradition uh, that's being practiced or the cosmology the practice operates within or even the beliefs that guide your practice. And the variations in authentic contemporary shamanic practice are rich and complex. Um, There is a vast field of very good work being done today by traditional practitioners all around the world and by people like me whose ancestors broke with their shamanic traditions long long ago and whose practice is not necessarily traditional but is in its own way authentic and so my point is that there's great variety in answering the question what does shamanic practice look like and I am not an authority I'm not even authority on my own practice because I'm still growing and learning and coming to understand Um, but with that said um, that fact that true shamanic practice looks different for different people at the same time for most practitioners there is a line that they crossed at some point when their early experimentation and their uncertain dabbling actually became a way of life that they could not back out of and then at that point there was only going forward And that is the point at which I believe um, shamanic activity becomes shamanic practice. And so today's show is really just um, in directly in response to um, some listeners' questions. And um, so uh, Mia and Amy uh, recently sent the question saying that they were talking about their difficulties in more deeply integrating shamanic practices into our daily lives, they said, given our wacky schedules, our work responsibilities, significant others, etc. And we were wondering how you manage to do all the things that you do, all the while integrating shamanic practices throughout each day. And we were thinking this would be a useful Why Shamanism Now episode, a day in the life of a contemporary shaman, if you will. And since I don't have a traditional practice, I can't answer this question from a traditional standpoint. Um, Each culture that has a living shamanic practice can answer that question from that perspective. I can only answer it from the perspective of a person who comes from broken shamanic lineage, who is, you know, raised in, raised up by a typical American family, um, in a small American town and, you know, went to public school and no one talked about shamans and public school uh, because of all of the vast politics that goes into textbooks. You know, the history often made my stomach hurt because literally because I knew I was being lied to and I didn't know yet how to go find the truth because, of course, there was no Google back in the olden days <laughs> when I was in school. Anyway, my point is. I can only really speak for what it's like to me 
um, and some of the people in my community that I, I'm aware of their practice. But I'll do my best with that because for many of us and those people that I believe um, – the show is really crafted for, which is those of us who didn't have that grandmother or grandfather that taught us, and yet we find ourselves here anyway. And the question is, how the hell do we do this? How do we do this in our contemporary lives and not just feel like we're playing Indian or something that is false for us because we're not really living in the culture out of which those particular practices came? And that's particular for those of you that travel to other cultures and learn about shamanism of different, you know, living traditions. So the main issue for us as contemporary practitioners, traditional or otherwise, is that we understand the function and we do not get lost in the form. There, there are many people who... A day in the life is filled with forms that are not functioning for them and yet they're putting the time and energy into it but they're not receiving what the function that form is meant to create and the more deeply we can understand how different aspects of our practice are meant to function we can assess whether or not it's functioning and if it isn't how to make it what needs to shift so that it can function. Um, so, for example, um, often in a relationship with our helping spirits, the reason that relationship isn't actually functioning as well as it could is because we actually have placed something in the way of that helping spirit working well with us. And so that's what I mean about being able to discern if something that should be working isn't, and we know that it should be because it works that way for other people in other cultures, we need to be able to understand why the function of that form isn't working for us. And I think that is really the key to being a contemporary shamanic practitioner. Do not accept the answer because that is how it's done. You can accept the answer. You need to experience it first to understand it. So just shut up and go do it. That's valid. But after you've done it, you should have the experience to be able to look back and go, oh, I see how that works. I see what that's trying to do. Oh, I get it. And to not just get caught up doing forms by rote because that's what somebody taught you. But to really dig in. So, for example, I spent a number of years studying with Maladoma Somme. And in the tradition of the Dagra people, they do blood sacrifice. And I, it is it is what it is. Um it isn't something North America asks for, and I live in North America. So I have to understand how, what are other ways to perform the same function that the blood sacrifice um, accomplishes in the Dagra tradition. How do I accomplish that same function without that same form? And that's that ability to understand your practice that deeply is the essence of then being able to be creative and figure out how do I make this work in my wacky life, as the ladies asked. So my short answer, so you can just do this and then you don't have to listen to the rest of the podcast if you don't want to. So my short answer is I make it work creatively. Um, I make it work by understanding the functions of things. I, I really want to understand how things work and why they work um, so that I have several ways to accomplish one function that um, depend on time um, or my needs in the moment. Um, another way that I make it work is with, is with a sense of humor, usually at myself. And that's a big piece is being willing to be humble, have a sense of humor and know that I will always be learning, that I, I can spend my whole life doing this and I will still barely scratch the, scratch the surface of what is available to me. So just to be humble and to know that I'm usually the butt of the jokes and to laugh. And finally, the, the main thing is that I choose again and again to stay in love. To orient myself each day in life in love. And that love is not dependent on who's with me or what is with me, what I'm getting back from other people, what I'm getting back from the spirit world, what I'm feeling in the moment. 
that I understand that everything is set in motion. Everything is set in motion in a particular way by my willingness to stand up each morning and choose to be in love in that day. And that everything grows from that. Everything unfolds from that. So my purpose today, again, is not to define the way shamanic practice should look, um, nor is it to define some version of right that would apply to everyone. Because even in a tradition that clearly defines shamans and their practice, everyone is still unique within that tradition. Um, My mother visited a village... um, a contemporary village that was designed to honor the heritage of the Sangoma in South Africa and to educate people about it. And the women that were there the um, talked about all of the training that they went through that was the same, exactly the same for each one of them. And then they showed the uniqueness in each one's uniqueness basically arose out of their strength in divination. And, and that relationship with those helping spirits that came through in their particular strong aspect of divination was then reflected in what they wore, the different power objects that they had on their person, etc. So one woman divined um, through weather and the clouds in particular. Another woman divined through stones and uh, very, very different energies that they were working with. And so even within a very clearly structured tradition and the fact that the women do many of the same things, basically the same, their uniqueness still shows. And it's always important to understand that about shamanic practitioners, especially in the contemporary world, that we all have different skills and different strengths and we all have weaknesses every single one of us have weaknesses um some say biases but the point is recognizing it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing so what your practice looks like is it's the practice that functions for you and um so what i'm going to do today is just continue to try to honestly as best as I can answer uh, Mia and Amy's question and to share more clearly what I mean when I say things like shamanic practice or use your skills because this question came dropped into my inbox uh, about the same time I was speaking with someone following up after a long distance session that I had done for them and um I, I already knew that this particular um, client had m- many years studying shamanism. And so I was making assumptions about a certain skill set that I'd asked about in the intake. And I knew that they had a certain skill set and, and this, this comfort and experience in shamanism. And so as I was talking about how she could follow up with the things that happened in her session, she, she got to a point and she said, but but Christina, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't know how to do that? You studied shamanism for three years. You have this skill set. And she goes, well, what do you mean by a shamanic skill set? And I thought, wow, okay. Um, And and it made me think, wow, how many times do I just say shamanic skill set on why shamanism now? And then don't go any further than that based on this assumption that you've listened to enough podcasts to know what I mean by that. So so today's kind of trying to right those errors, perhaps, and to talk a little bit more in detail about what I do mean when I say shamanic skill set and when I say shamanic practice. Um, So let's start with practice. There are actually many shows that do talk about practice. And the essence of those shows is the simple and challenging truth that your practice is what you do every day. Everyone has a practice. Many of you have practices that are not intentional. So think about what you do all day. The things in particular, the things that you do every day, you know, they are your practice. 
And so if you don't like what your life adds up to at the end of the day, you might want to look at your practice. What is it that you do every day? So practice implies this is something that I do basically every day, right? So in a qi, even in a Qigong practice, my um, one of my teachers used to say, you know, you have three days to move the energy forward, two days um, to restore, one day that's a random practice, whatever you feel is right, and one day off. So that's every day. <laughs> Practicing every day still means you get one day off. <laughs> so keep that in mind. This isn't about perfection. It's about recognizing it. What does it mean to live in practice? What does it mean to have a living practice? And um, to be honest with yourself about engaging in your practice. So um, what do you do every day? What I do every day in some way is hang out at my shrines or at my altars with a group of helping spirits or potentially everybody depending on what the day has in store for me. And I engage in relationship with my helping spirits every day I engage in the cosmology that I practice within because for me it's very three-dimensional it's 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 a sphere of helping spirits that create a greater story of a cosmology of how I got here and why I'm here and why we're all here and what's going on and all of that being back in each day to that is my practice and I do it every day just like and stepping in to love and living the day in love is a practice and I do it every day and so these are the fundamental pieces the whole rest of the day may run completely off track but I won't run off track if I do those basic track practices that keep me centered even when the day turns into a shitstorm. And sometimes it does. I mean, there's a lot of factors in our life we have no control over. And the fact that everything goes sideways doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. But I cannot tell you how many emails I get from people who have taken the grounding challenge or something about boundaries. One of those two things completely changing the quality of their life and recognizing when things start to go sideways energetically in the day. It is often our own grounding and our own boundaries. So for me, the practice of grounding and boundaries was something I spent a great deal of time doing in my 20s and my 30s. I'm now in my 50s and my energy body is cultivated in a way that those original practices I did are not necessary on a daily basis. But other things are necessary now on a daily basis. And so the other thing to expect about your practice is if you are evolving as a human being through your life, they will change. Certain things will become incorporated, become your norm. Other things will evolve. And new, new dynamics of the practice will take their place. Um, however, things really go sideways in a bad way. If I forget to start the day in love, which that is rare, what is more often is I get well into my day before I've actually sat with the helping spirits and checked in, let them know what I'm trying to do today, what help I need, and worked that relationship that I have with the helping spirits. And often when things just get really frustrating and sideways, I turn around and I recognize, wow, I didn't even open the ancestral shrine today and tell them what's going on and ask for their help. And that moment of stopping. Now, of course, I work at home, so I can stop. I can go to the ancestral shrine. I can take five minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes, right? Not so much if you're at the office. Well, do you have a cubicle? Do you have a little shrine in your cubicle that everybody else thinks is just weird stuff on your desk? Do you have a portable altar that can go with you that you can set up while you're there at work and take down because you don't want to leave it there overnight? So that's my point about being creative, Maybe because of the crazy path you have to take to work and the craziness of your work situation, maybe you need a little traveling altar that just goes with you. My most essential traveling altar is a candle and a vessel for water. Fire and water, balance. These two essential elements, that is the shorthand. It's like the shortest hand for the whole cosmology that I operate in. 
And in some places where I can't, I know I'm not going to be able to have fire or water, sometimes I'll bring four stones, four directions, four elements, four main archetypes, and, the, and four chambers of the heart. All And it, all those four stones in one place set intentionally on a tiny little cloth can speak to my whole cosmology no matter where I am. Now it doesn't work so well on a boat, right? So, so my point is be creative. Figure out how to accomplish that function of your daily connecting yourself into your cosmology, into your helping spirits, into your body, into your grounding. How do you do that daily? Be creative. Understand the function and if it works, do it. Now, another thing to be very realistic about is some days you need a quick version, but if you only do the quick version, you will stunt your growth. But it's important to have a quick version. It's important to have a longer version. It's important to have the big, yummy, juicy version that does take time, but it gives the opportunity for the communication with spirit to truly be both ways and to really allow the energy of your heart to flow into that dynamic. So that was practice. (laughs) We're halfway through the show. Um, So what makes it then shamanic practice? So for it to be shamanic, it must engage spirit or these invisible energies, however you want to think of who it is that we engage with shamanically. But the whole thing that makes something shamanic is you developing your own working relationship with these invisible energies that for shorthand we refer to as spirit in in general. So the energies... The important thing about these energies is that they are the energies that allow us to more easily connect with what is not obvious, what is in effect behind the scenes of the physical world, to connect with the real energies. These are the energies that allow us to feel that we are part of something larger. We, we, as our small energy body, are in relationship with something much bigger, a much bigger energy body, something that is bigger, more vast, more eternal something that is bigger than just humanity. I I think there's far too many practitioners that entirely see their role as a shaman shaman and therefore as a healer um, functioning entirely for humanity. And not that humanity doesn't have more than enough for all of us to try to heal. But the point is that's not shamanism. Shamanism is a connection with something larger than humanity, something that humanity certainly fits into and is part of, but this larger story of all life. That's shamanic. So that's what makes your practice shamanic. If you're not doing that, it's some other form of energy practice, some other form of healing practice. And there's nothing wrong with that. What makes it shamanic practice is your constant engagement um, or awareness, I would say, and, and periodic engagement with these energies that are invisible for most of us that are connect us to the world that's bigger than we are and the energies that are not apparent but that are the real energies behind the scenes that engagement is what makes it shamanic and that those relationships need to be engaged in for them to be strong and useful working relationships and many people make the mistake of separating their shamanism from their daily life Because I began without teachers, physical teachers for the most part. I learned skills but not how to live shamanically from human teachers. The Helping Spirits taught me how to live shamanically because I – most of my initial questions for the first two years of my having learned to journey had absolutely nothing to do with shamanic healing. They had everything to do with how do I live my life? How do I make it work? How do I know why I'm here? How? how, how? Help. <laughs> Yikes. You know. <laughs> and recognizing that my working relationship with my helping spirits becomes part of informing my everyday life, the everyday choices that I make. Not that I journey to find out what kind of toothpaste to buy. That's not my point. But my point is that I'm not 
preserving the shamanism for this journey circle I go to once a month when I ask big questions about, you know, why am I here? But I'm engaging in a working relationship with my helping spirits in the everyday investigation of why am I here? What's going on in my wake? How do I live life more gracefully? And how do I do what I've come here to do? That those are daily questions for someone who's in a shamanic practice. How can I approach this really frustrating work group in a way that is not so frustrating? What is going on? Why is it so frustrating? How do I help to shift this energy? Can I shift this energy? You know, these are really valid questions to talk to your helping spirits about. And for people that are really struggling with incorporating their shamanic practice into their everyday life, what I notice for them is there's a, a limiting belief in their mind that this keeps the two separate instead of incorporating them each into the other. Okay, so in other words, in terms of this being a shamanic practice, right, I could just teach my clearing class, right, and work with emotional and energy clearing with people. And that would be a great job. I would love doing it. It'd be a great service to do. And it would really allow me to develop that and create online courses and write the books and all this stuff, right? Um, it would not be shamanic because it wouldn't involve working with helping spirits necessarily. All right. So the point is we can do great work and, and it's a practice, but it's not necessarily shamanic practice. Okay. So I can circle back to why I see the emotional clearing at, well, I wouldn't even circle back. I may run out of time. Why do I actually see the emotional clearing as part of my shamanic practice because I believe as contemporary people that are raised outside of a shamanic culture we need emotional clearing and a clearing technique to be able to deal with the aftermath of have be having been raised in a western culture and the and the just sort of toxic beliefs of most of our family systems and our cultural systems even our religious systems and definitely our school systems and certainly our political systems so we have a lot of clearing to do to get to a place that is more neutral and authentic for who we are and so i believe that a contemporary person who is not raised in a shamanic tradition. I don't mean you're a contemporary person and now you're traveling to a shamanic tra cultural tradition. I mean you were raised in it. If you were not raised in it, then I believe an emotional and energetic clearing practice is absolutely necessary for your shamanic practice or you will be distorting your perception of your relationship with spirit. It's very simple. So the next thing is as a contemporary shamanic practitioner, make sure you have a skill to do clearing and to use it daily and at least weekly. And that's that's just part of the um, terrain. If you want the help from spirit and you want to do it in the world in a good way, which most of us do want to do it in a good way, then as a contemporary person, you must learn emotional and energetic clearing, um, some form to be able to do that. And um, we have to find a way to fit it in. But what you find after the effort to fit it in, then a lot of stuff that took your energy before isn't going to take it anymore. That it will simplify and in a sense essentialize and purify your life so that you get way more back in terms of time and energy and resources that were being spent churning in the dramas in your life that you were getting sucked into, that you get way more energy back than you put in in the first place. That is a big uh, energetic exchange. So in the beginning, it feels like you can't possibly do it. You can't possibly get away to Portland for the one weekend, <laughs> one weekend to learn this skill. Um, you can't possibly do any of that. But the truth is you can. And then once you do, you start to get this energetic exchange from your life where you start to get resources and energy back because they're no longer being wasted. That's another thing to recognize about shamanic practice is it's worth the effort to find a way to do these new things because in the doing of it, you stop doing old things. 
And then that energy cycles back in, that time opens up, those friends fall away, stuff happens that starts to clarify and essentialize your life and you end up having the time and energy that you need where, where you thought before it was impossible. Okay, so to be a shamanic practice, there must be the intent to work with the invisible energies that are non-human and to do so daily, um, not just when you go do your ayahuasca on Friday night. That doesn't count as a working relationship with spirit, right? That this is, this is where working with spirit is where the, the understanding and the training in it and using shamanic trance states really comes in. So these are things that I don't do every day, but they happen periodically, right? Because they're part of a shamanic practice. So cultivating my ability to journey, and to engage with spirit through journeying and taking time to cultivate my capacity to enter into embodiment trance states where the helping spirits are coming into me and move through me and that cultivating that is part of my shamanic practice and it is a way to embody my helping helping spirits and to work with them and to understand them and to let that relationship grow often I can better understand what a helping spirit is trying to communicate to me by dancing that energy and maybe singing, allowing a song to come through than trying to understand it intellectually because maybe it's not an intellectual sort of knowledge-based answer. So it's important to give your helping spirits in the development of that working relationship periodic opportunities to communicate with you through journeying and through embodiment. It's I think for most contemporary people, it's unless you're – well, I think for most contemporary people, it is an unrealistic expectation to be able to journey every day for yourself. Many do journey every day, but that's because they're also journeying for other people if they're um, shamanic healers. Okay. But the point is, point is that you engage in these skills to develop them, but also to use the engagement in them to develop your relationship with spirit. Now, to have a healthy relationship with spirit then requires a certain cultivation of energy awareness and your energy body cultivation. And there's a new show called Energy Body Hygiene about this that helps some people get it in a way they hadn't really gotten it listening to other shows so that you can search for that in the search field at the whyshamanismnow.com site, find Energy Body Hygiene. But this talks about the regular cultivation of grounding, boundaries, clearing, clearing cords, and clearing chakras. These things are all basic if you're going to work with spirit. And as I said earlier in this show, what I needed to do to do that in my 20s and my 30s evolved over time because the clearing works and eventually it starts to shift what it is that you need to clear. I still use those skills. I still have to upgrade my boundaries and my grounding periodically as my own energy changes and evolves. I mean, thank goodness, right? Or we'd get ridiculously bored with ourselves. So we're supposed to be changing and growing and learning and evolving. So we grow out of ourselves, hopefully, regularly. And so part of the ability to, you know, what does a contemporary shamanic practice looks like? Well, there's always something you're doing for grounding. But once you've mastered grounding then what it takes for you to be grounded will evolve over time same thing with boundaries same thing with clearings energy emotional clearing same thing with cord cutting same thing with um, clearing chakras that that this your relationship with your energy body evolves as you do if you're paying attention to it but in the beginning I have to tell you in the beginning it required my attention every day until I was able to create over time a new energy body habit that was no longer that which was shaped in the first 18 years in my family of origin slash culture slash time but became what I was intending to be and it came it it, it evolved in that way not because I had a lot of money to pay other people to do healing work for me because I didn't I had no money it came because I practiced and I made it a priority to spend my time in that practice because it became pretty clear as I started to shift, not um, in the beginning I would shift and then fall back and shift and fall back. But in the very beginning, it was also very clear that when it did shift forward, 
I started receiving those resources I was talking about as I stopped pouring my energy into all of this other stuff that I was doing, which was typical um, human drama around work, around survival, around friends, around lovers, etc., around what food I should be eating, all of these things we get so caught up in. And the more I worked with spirit, the more I was able to gain perspective, the more the unnecessary stuff fell away, the more the reason for the unnecessary stuff was revealed so that I could heal and transform it, etc. So you get my point. There's no, there's no way to get there without investing the time and energy in getting there. Um, and the truth is, cultivating your own energy body and the quality of person that you want to be in your relationships is the fastest way to find the relationships that you want. Sleeping with people isn't. And believe me, I did it. I, nothing wrong with it. But it's not, I, I hear far too many people say, well, I have to have sex. It's like, well, no, you really don't. What you have to do is get your energy organized. And having sex with people is one of the fastest ways to just scramble it. So there's nothing wrong with having sex with people. But I hear too many people use my need for sex as if it's air. Right as the excuse for not ever having time to do their practice. And that is a merry-go-round people that you need to get off of. And then that's spoken from someone who absolutely loves and enjoys sex. But I much prefer living my soul's purpose. Thank you very much. Okay, so there are ways uh, to communicate with invisible energies and if you're doing a shamanic practice being in communication with these invisible energies is the key to that being shamanic that practice being shamanic so we need to develop our capacity over time to be a more reliable vehicle to be in relationship with spirit so how do you do that so what you would be working on over time is working with a divination tool regularly to open up your own um, intuitive capacities and your extrasensory capacities. Another way to practice is just to actually trust your intuition and do what it tells you to do no matter how weird that is. That is a really challenging practice that most of you have an intuition that's trying to communicate with you all the time but you're not listening and when you do hear it you go, I don't need my umbrella. Yes, yes you do. Right? So anyway, so trust, just to have a practice of absolutely trusting your intuition doing whatever it says when it says to do it and see what happens another thing is learning to notice the messages that life is giving you to notice the coincidences notice the messages notice the things that need to be cleared all of these things are the way life communicates with you and actually receive the message understand what the message is telling you allow it to affect your actions that whole process is how you open up your intuitive capacity noticing messages from each of your four wisdom bodies it's another pra practice an ongoing practice of how do you connect with the wisdom of your physical body how do you connect with the wisdom of your heart and your emotional body how do you connect with the wisdom of your mind not just the crazy multitasking, I've got to go check Facebook, ah, go for the bright shiny things quality of your mind, but the actual capacity of your mind to track an energy, to recognize uh, the truth amongst the forest of other things. I mean, your mind has a great many jobs in a shamanic practice, and mostly it's too pooped from doing a whole bunch of other things it doesn't need to do to do its main jobs. And how do you cultivate paying attention to the messages from your spiritual wisdom body. All of these things would be something for this month, I'm going to focus on this. Okay, For this month, I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to reflect back. What did I learn? What worked for me? What, what functions functioned? And what forms seemed empty? And to keep learning and trying. You can't do all of it at all times. But you, know, you would always want there to be a project, basically. What are you working on this month? What are you working on this week? What are you working on today? You know, to evolve your intuitive capacities because the shamanic skills all connect in to our innate intuition capacities and our imagination. And so you want to do things that allow your intuition and your imagination and in particular, your trust in them. And you're willing to let them be free to give you the information they're trying to give you. That's what you're really cultivating. 
um, the most important thing in it, though, is to use your interpretations of things and see what happens. In other words, let it affect your choices. Let it affect your actions in the world. Risk doing something that has been guided by your intuition and see what comes back so you can learn to refine and adjust and fine tune. And ultimately, what you can also learn then is to clear where you see you're truly distorting things. I spent a lot of time, particularly in the first two years when I was struggling, I was poor, was trying to figure out why the hell I was here, I was journeying, was applying it to my life. And the other skill that I had with journeying was clearing. And so because I was tracking my journeys, the interpretation of the answer, what actions I took, and then what happened, I was able to see where I wasn't interpreting properly. Because when we work with spirit in that way and let it inform our actions in life, take those actions and reflect on that and see what happens, things are almost always better than we imagine they could be. So when they're not, we haven't done something in that process. And so that was what I did a lot of in the beginning was reflecting on what happened, especially when it, especially when it didn't go well and go, okay, so how, how did that happen? What, what needs to be cleared in me so that I am a better receptor? How can I be more accurate in my ability to receive the messages from spirit? And so all of those things are part of especially the beginning um, years, not months, not weeks, years of a shamanic practice is to really open up your heart and open up your capacity for intuition so that you can really learn to be um, – free and open and yet with grounding and boundaries in your relationship with spirit and so the important thing is is not about needing to journey every day it's about being able to journey when you need to or being able to use a divination tool when you need to and uh, to know what it what it feels like when you need to and to be willing to do it anyway and don't rationalize yourself out of it to know what that feels like and to understand that going to spirit as part of our problem solving in life is part of what it means to be. It's, it's, it's the essence of what it means to be a shamanic practitioner is that you go to spirit to inform the way you live your life. Um, so this means then, you know, that we need to be, um, cultivating that relationship with spirit so for many of these things about developing intuition these were things these actions that i just described were things i that were part of my day in the life in my earlier years in my 20s and my 30s um, and the beginning of my shamanic practice as the cycle teachings began to came come in then understanding and living based on those teachings became the way that I continue to develop my intuition and my relationship with spirit. And so, in other words, there's always a project. You're always intentionally engaged in developing your capacity with something. And in doing that, you're open to what spirit has to say to you and it allows things to unfold. So there's, there's always something in a good way. There's always some awareness that you're, you're working to develop yourself and your openness to spirit, your accuracy with spirit in some way. You can't do all of it all the time, but you can always be doing something in the kind of in the background of your life. Like your work may be the entree, but you always have the salad. The salad is the project, the shamanic project. Um, for me, because I did become a shamanic healer, there was a lot of development that came through doing shamanic healing. But I can only do so much shamanic healing in a week and, and be in good relationship with myself and my own energy. So there's a lot of other days that other things need to happen. And so I'm really talking about a day in the life of a shamanic practitioner, not necessarily a shamanic healer. And so I'm really just talking about what is the practice? What are the things that are part of every day? So well, I got to um, cultivating a relationship with spirit. So this has been a big change in my life because, again, I didn't have 
human teachers that taught me how to cultivate relationship with spirit. They just taught me the helping spirits are there. You journey to them. They help you as if they are, um, you know, just, um, well, like a vending machine, exactly like the article that's circulating on Facebook right now. It's like they're just there as a vending machine. You can just drop in your quarter and get your candy bar. And I, I didn't personally feel that was right relationship with spirit because I there were some men who tried to behave that way with me and be in, in that kind of relationship with me. And I didn't like how that felt. And so consequently, I realized that the helping spirits probably don't like being treated that way either. And so um, the point is what I had to do in the beginning of my life um, evolved because I began to get smarter. I began to see how other cultures actually practiced and I also began to accept that my human teachers perhaps were not correct or at least were not complete. And so I started working more with power objects and from power objects I started working more with an altar and from having an altar – I actually had an altar in the beginning to be honest but it became a shamanic altar once the shamanism started. So having a place that I communicate with spirit, having an altar that has power objects that are all part of what I'm trying to do each year at the new year, which is also my birthday. They're coming at very much the same time. So in the winter, I would clear off the altar and bring everything back. Certain things would not come back on, new th- other things would, things that I'm in constant relationship, of course, would come back. But there was always something different in the center. And whatever that was, was the thing I really wanted everything to focus on over the course of that year. So again, shamanic practice is, is daily. But it's also about keeping in the back of your mind this larger person that you are with a larger agenda than just getting to work, taking care of your kids and making sure you've got dinner tonight. And those things are important, but they're not everything. There needs to always be the project, the shamanic project in the back of the mind and working with spirit to help to make that happen. Because there's so many unseen factors that contribute to something happening in your life and there's so many factors outside of your control that contribute to having things happen in your life. When we work with spirit through as a shamanic practitioner daily and also weekly, monthly, annually, as we work with spirit in a good way, in good relationship with spirit, all those unseen factors and those factors out of your control get organized by the helping spirits. So that that thing that we manifest in our life is not only that thing we were focused on manifesting, but that is better than we imagined. And that is that whole thing I'm saying is where when we're willing to commit our time and energy and resources to those relationships, to cultivating them and using them to make our life happen, that when we're willing to co-create in that way, we get energy back. It's better than we imagined. The impossible is made possible. And that doesn't happen by a human being alone. It happens in the relationship. And so the relationship with spirit needs to be part of every day. So for me, cultivating my relationship with helping spirit suddenly kicked into high gear when I realized the importance of working with the altar, developing shrines to particular unique energies, learning <clears throat> excuse me, learning how to work with the shrines, learning songs, singing the songs, learning prayers, speaking the prayers, memorizing the prayers, and beginning to create a kind of ceremony and a repetition and a momentum and how I worked with spirit, when I worked with spirit, the ways that I worked with spirit in my in grounding that in my own life. And that's when I finally opened the door to realize these are meant to be intimate relationships. It's not meant for us, as wounded as we are as contemporary people, to go to the helping spirits and finally have that pouring in of the big cosmic love to us and go, oh, this is how I've always wanted to be loved. Oh, this is so wonderful. That's a first step and it's important. But ultimately, we're meant to take that in as a healing and move on and keep growing and evolving into a spiritually mature adult who can open that door in their own heart to create as as an adult, I can't say as an equal, but as an adult with boundaries and grounding and not so needy, 
but to show up as a person with a soul's purpose, open that door of intimacy and come into deep, intimate relationship with the helping spirits. And then what I said in the beginning of the show, to start each day in love is obvious. It is natural. It is your natural state of being because you've put in the time, you've done the practices, you've put in the work to become an adult who can open his or her heart to these helping spirits and know we are not alone. And we are in an experience that is all different manifestations of expressions of love. And that to stand in love at all times is obvious. It is our natural state of being. And for me, that's the practice. And I give thanks to the helping spirits that taught me this because I would not have learned this had I only listened to humans. And I certainly wouldn't have learned it now. I would still be seeking. So I give great gratitude to the helping spirits in their many forms, to the ancestors that stand around here and help us in their many forms, to the earth below, the sky above, and the heart that unite us all. And I want to let everybody know that the classroom space in Portland is very small and the fall classes are already starting to fill up. So if you're interested in the clearing class, if you're interested in learning to journey, or you're interested in the ancestral healing class, they are in September and October um, of the of this year um, here in Portland. And you can register through the lastmaskcenter.org site and... Um, you can register online. And I forgot to say, my Year of Ceremony ceremony will be May 21st, and you can still register for the Year of Ceremony on the homepage on my website. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.